Let's talk about 2001, maybe. The very opening of the movie is like an orchestra tuning up, and it's mm -hmm. the suggestion. There is black before you see MGM. Mm -hmm. it, there's black, and you just hear this pulsing. You just hear the strings. And then you get the MGM logo. This is So there's something pre-MGM logo. Yeah. And then the it's boom, boom, boom. And it has a theatrical opening. Stanley Kubrick. 2001 and all this this thing and then you get this really strange sequence with the animals first of all the pigs and the monkeys together i don't know how he did that it's not clear to me how he accomplished any of this in 1968 i don't understand how he had these these monkey people obviously in suits but really good ones space and, space and apes is a thing that americans we even sent apes into space it's a thing that's very interesting. But so these past, apes, yeah. yeah. So there's apes and there's pigs all around them and they're yelling at the pigs and the pigs aren't leaving. And I don't know how the fuck where they got these weird pigs. And then there's a wild cat that kills a fucking guy. I don't know how they did that. And it has yellow eyes. Yeah. I don't know how they got a wild cat to attack this guy. It's not CGI. It's not a puppet. It's not clay. It's fucking real looking. Uh, yes. And then... Um, there it's it, this movie has feeling because these beasts are scared in the cave they're yeah. staying awake because there's roaring and they're they look depressed and they're traumatized and scared and then when that thing comes with the weird people going which was this is why kubrick was just weird he was a weird dude and he suggested a aura of energy with a chorus of people singing <laughs> and you see the apes trying to touch the thing and, and at first it's sort of too hot to touch but then they're able to really smoothen it and then he has this incredible um, in, uh, restraint because just as that scene is warming up it cuts it's just suddenly over you don't really resolve it mm -hmm. and it goes back to these quiet peaceful shots of this fucking probably uh, Joshua Tree and you're left going what the fuck what the fuck happened he's willing to do that and most filmmakers today won't do it because because audiences have demands and they say mm -hmm. I want to I want it to be clear and I want to know what's happening but he goes we're just starting to show you this and now we're taking it away from you and you're going what the fuck happened and it keeps you a little nauseous and unsure. Very specific moment in this movie where the, the monkey throws the bone in the air. It's almost corny, but it's good. The bone tumbles through the air and it becomes a spaceship. And then yeah. this beautiful music starts and it kind of suggests that there is beauty in our aggression, that right. our aggression leads to, uh, to, to things that are celestial and beautiful. The second half, all everything that happens on that ship with Hal and everything and then the ending, is so big and it makes you it shrinks in your memory the first half yeah but the first half is a very important yeah and i mean the first part of the movie is about this guy dr joyce who just his story just ends it doesn't mm -hmm. come to, it doesn't get any conclusion and kubrick isn't that interested in him as a person mm -hmm. he, he gives him one personal scene where he's calling his daughter which is made so to make it clear to you don't worry about this guy He's not a father who has issues. He's not like in a bad marriage. Look, I have a big question. What is a bush baby? That's what I want. To it sounds like that you're allowed to buy African babies. What do you want? A bush baby, huh? We'll have to see about that because these aren't space people. The mundane. These are corporate people. These are managers. So yeah, like I'm sure they gave him options for like the first drawings they sent him for like the inside of the space station that goes in circles uh, oh, in the Earth orbit, that the inside was all bumpy and lots of lights flashing. And he was like, no, it's a, it's a hallway of a government building. Yeah. It's a, it's a immigration way station. And, but, but the floor should just be gently curved because you're yeah. always walking in a circle. And it's crazy You go because you really believe that's what they would build. Then he has this sequence to get you to the moon that takes a long time. And it's plotting and it's slow, but there's a point behind it. I we hadn't even been there yet. Which is crazy and that this movie there came were, out. There were space movies. There were mm. spaceship movies, but it was just about the kind of boyish, <laughs> <laughs> like 
silver, wee, wee, you know, and like, ah, oh, turn the laser beam on the thing and monsters. It just, it wasn't, they weren't serious movies. None of yeah. them were. And yeah. what he does here is very meticulous, which is the first thing that takes you out there. There's two different ships that he travels on. One of them is like a little airplane because it has to make its way through the atmosphere because it's meant to fly with wings. But the thing that goes from the space station to the moon is just a ball. And it's a completely different world than the spaceship with that has uh, airplane uh, seats with fucking jet blue fucking screens in the seat. I mean, it's so exact. I want to know what movie he's watching, but he's watching a movie on a screen in front of the seat in front of him. It's it's precisely like today's seats in movie theaters. I mean, in, in uh, on on airplanes. Um, and it's he it's not NASA. It's Pan Am, which is an airline I remember flying when I was a kid. With playing with gravity and playing with relative motion and the flight attendant walking in the upside down, which I, I don't know how he did it in today's cinema. I, I don't know how he did it. It looks so good. It looks better than a lot of modern effects. Yes. But the fact that he takes such a long time to get you out there and the logic of how he does it is so precise. And the massiveness of the of the space station that they fly into it's bigger than any science fiction they have never made something look so big this is the crazy thing about this movie is that it's it's a it's a strange abstract suggestion of the of the of being itself and then it's a space movie just a fucking satisfying space movie and uh then it's a a mystery a strange mystery and then it's a horror movie a fucking horror movie and then it's a action film like the him get how he how David survives, and then it ends as just a fucking art house nutty yeah. crazy <laughs> psycho what the fuck so philosophical crazy. painting. He he does not follow your basic uh, three act um, storytelling structure. I don't I can't think of any of his films that do that that really go like set up the characters take them through their conflicts, resolve it, and land the movie. He doesn't do it. He, he doesn't just doesn't. This movie yeah. has, has two parts, and he, he like. And Kubrick says he wanted to suggest these things. He wanted to give people a feeling of this stuff, cinematically, instead, yeah. instead of explaining it. And it wasn't meant to be like, oh, well, that's not what people saw, so we did it wrong. He kind of just gave you these these brush strokes to give you that, that feeling. And this monolith is left totally unexplained and mysterious, something you couldn't do in cinema today unless you got at some point explained absolutely everything and what Kubrick did with cinema was to say let's take out all that clarity and replace it with mysterious ambiguity that makes everyone's brain decide a different thing about what they're seeing I think that's the greatest thing about his work